All right, perfect. Well, it is 10 o'clock and we've got a packed agenda. So I will start some housekeeping while folks are joining the meeting. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this morning for many of you. Um, we've, we've been on these webinars now for the last few weeks. Um, some of you are attending today for the first time. Either way, we're excited to have you here. We're excited to have John here. Um, he is leading a series of webinars for us that really go deep into some topics that employers care about when it comes to education and talent. This is a companion piece to a toolkit that we will be launching very soon um, that really goes deep into things like building education assistance programs and strengthening work-based learning and um, really just you know creating a more education-friendly workplace. And I think that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, aside from the policies and the more technical things that employers can put in place to support education, um, how can employers just create a culture where folks feel supported and sort of, um, you know, encouraged to pursue education opportunities? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before I turn it over to John, just a few quick things. This is being recorded. So if you want to share this with colleagues after or want to revisit any topics, I will send out the recording shortly after we wrap up today. Um, you are all on mute, but this is a very sort of low key conversational format. So John will pause frequently to ask if you have questions, but if, if something comes up and you have a question, feel free to hop off mute and ask or put it in the chat and I will make sure that John gets it. Um, and I think there'll be some time at the end for Q&A as well. So please feel free to, to jump in if you need clarification or want to ask a question about anything. Um, some of you know John by now, but for those of you who don't, I will let him introduce himself in a little bit more depth. Uh, but John has worked with us now for the last several months on developing this toolkit and really just helping us think through how we can support employers in their education and talent endeavors. So I will turn it over to him. We've got a packed hour and um, let him tell you a bit more about his work and then we'll dive into learning culture. So thanks again. Awesome, thank you very much. Everyone can you hear me okay? Fabulous. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about how to get started with a learning culture. And uh, there are lots of different ways to think about a learning culture and lots of different definitions, but we're gonna try and be very precise about, um, about learning cultures and give you some very practical tips on, on where to get started. Uh, and so um, just some background uh, for people who don't know me. Uh, I've got a 25 year career in learning and talent management. I have a, a particular expertise in tuition and education assistance. And I, I would say that these are, are uh, key attributes of or key reflections of the learning culture. Uh, I currently own and operate my own upskilling and reskilling consulting firm. I actually started out as a high school teacher many years ago. I taught economics and government in uh, at Skyland High School in inner city Oakland. And I got an opportunity to open a charter school. Uh, eventually I decided that the most interesting things in education were happening in the tech sector. And uh, I moved and started working at Oracle uh, uh, de developing and delivering a lot of their training programs. Uh, eventually I moved to Visa and then about uh, 12, 13 years ago, I got a call from a headhunter about a job at Discover where they asked me to run all of their call center training programs. And uh, one thing led to another and eventually I became the chief learning officer there. It actually went pretty darn well. And uh, I was ended up being quoted in Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, CNN, uh, Money, really all around reskilling and upskilling. Uh, and at some point I realized that I had more of an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to help people outside of Discover than inside of Discover. And so I decided to leave the company. I started my own consulting firm. And I work with many clients who are, are working around the questions of future of work, around upskilling and reskilling. And uh, here are just some of the, the partners that I work with, uh, Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, Jobs for the Future, Guild Education, Kaplan Education, Prologis, uh, Sterling Partners, there, there are more than this, but these are sort of the, um, some, of the, some of the main partners that I, that I work with. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about how um, 
to uh, it's we're going to really sort of make the case for a learning culture and we're going to start by talking about how to accommodate business disruption and business disruption is uh, the velocity of business disruption have, has increased. And so how do you manage to accommodate that disruption? We're going to define a le learning culture, and then we're going to talk about how learning actually drives innovation. And finally, we're going to talk about tips to building a learning culture. And we are going to, uh, going to talk about seven very practical things that you can start doing immediately to build a learning culture at your enterprise. So let's go, go way back into ancient times and let's talk about the innovation cycle all the way up to 2000, uh, 2008. Interestingly enough, in 2007, uh, that was sort of a benchmark year in which 50% of American house households had broadband uh, online access. And before that, I mean, it was the, the digital revolution was building up speed, but didn't, uh, didn't uh, uh, saturate all, all households and even 50% of households in uh, the United States. And, and really, when we think about business disruption, the old model was that you had a business as usual. And let's say, for example, you're a car manufacturer, and then there's some sort of business disruption. Maybe all of a sudden people like teal, and you got to figure out, uh-oh, people want teal. We got to figure out how to paint our cars teal. And so typically what that meant is, is you start by collecting data. Let, let's try to understand how many people really like teal. What shades of teal do they like? Uh, let's design a process and let's think about our supply chain and let's try and figure out how do we add teal as one of the colors. Uh, then let's design that, that, that process, let's roll it out, and then you have a new business as usual, and that helps you by the time uh, there's a new disruption because everything is back to steady state. So the companies that excelled in this approach where whenever there's a business disruption, they went heads down into data collection, process design, and then process rollout, you know, those were companies like Ford Motor Company, uh, Bethlehem Steel, uh, Chevron. And really the keys to success in this kind of environment is you have to have a small number of really good problem solvers. You have to have great process design and you have to have, a, have a, you know, you have to be mostly made up of really good order takers. But, um, but that was kind of the approach for companies for, for, you know, and I'll say centuries um, up until uh, what I'll say is the, the innovate, the, um, the onset of the VUCA world. And the VUCA world, if you haven't heard this term, it's, it's bandied around a, a lot. Uh, our world is, this, is volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. Um, and it, really the VUCA world has two main drivers. The first is, is digital disruption, is that there's this digitization of business from business development to customer experience to backend operations, you know, across the entire value chain. And that has really changed the way companies companies operate. Um, and if you think about um, a company like like uh, Sears, let's say for example, Sears wanted to uh, to uh, redo its its uh, its stores globally. They they decided, you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna just do a facelift on all our stores. That would probably take a decade. Let's think about how fast Amazon could do that. If Amazon needed to refresh their stores, they could do it globally and probably in a few months, right? So digital, digital disruption is one of those things, just the pace of innovation has dramatically changed. The other big driver of this VUCA world is global liquidity. And there's just extraordinarily low interest rates and easy access to capital. I mean, it used to be that the, that if you had a new business, you had really two options to, to develop, to, to uh, collect capital. One is you could go to a bank and two is you could sell shares of your enterprise. And, you know, I mean, the, the number of, uh, of avenues to finance operations now has just exploded and the interest rates are incredibly low. I mean, for, you know, not only are there, are there, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of angel investors wandering around trying to figure out where to park their money, but I mean, you could run a GoFundMe campaign for goodness sakes. And, and that, that combination of digital disruption plus uh, this global liquidity has really changed the entire innov in innovation cycle. And so you can think about that um, when accommodating business disruption, it used to be 
business as usual, data collection, process design, new process rollout, new bi uh, business as usual. That worked pretty well when maybe you had a business disruption every five years. But now you have these disruptions about every 18 months, and they're really significant disruptions to business. And so companies that, that, that tried to match the, the, uh, the new VUCA world with the old innovation cycle, JCPenney, Kodak, Borders, I mean, these are companies that just couldn't adapt as fast as they needed to, to adapt. And, you know, I mean, the keys to success in this environment are, hey, great bankruptcy and liquidation plan, because that's essentially where, where it goes. If you can't keep up with disruptions that are going to be happening at least every 18 months, I mean, you're going to have to have a liquidation plan because there's, there's, there's no alternative for you in this economy. So the question becomes, if you, if you need to, to address these business disruptions on an accelerated basis as a result of the digitization of business and increased global liquidity, really, what enables a company to succeed in this world? And I think there are lots of different answers, but a bedrock of, 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 of the solution is a learning culture. And, you know, the characteristics of, of a learning culture really can vary, and, and there are lots of different definitions, but most talent development leaders will say that it has three different pieces. First, it has, it's, it's, it's based on organizational values that affirm learning's importance. Two, it's, clo it's, it's the ability to closely align your learning strategy with your business strategy and use learning strategy to drive business strategy. And three, it's a set of practices and processes that ingrain learning and day-to-day -day activities of every employee. And so, and, and we're gonna come back to this definition. In fact, we're gonna sort of break things up. We'll give you some tips in each one of these areas. But a learning culture is really critical to, to the VUCA world. And I'll, I'll explain sort of how this works, that the new innovation cycle in the new world is really when there is this business disruption, you got business as usual and you have this disruption. And instead of just taking a lot of time to collect data and design a process and implement a, pro uh, a process, it's much faster. It's learn, adapt, and start a new business as usual. And this is the type of type of, of, of innovation cycle that can, can match the pace of business today. So companies that, that excel in this, uh, Visa is one, IBM is another, Amazon is another. And, and the things that make these companies effective in this, this VUCA world are a, v a variety of things, but one is uh, is is learning, and so they need to have agile work processes and distributed decision makers uh, making. They need to have leaders that delegate and foster engagement, and then they have to have a company wide focus on learning because agile work processes and 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 delegation only work if you have um, a, a bevy of employees who really are at, um, active learners all the time. So. Well, I'm going to give you a few examples, and then we're going to, and then we're going to stop, and we'll ask some, and we'll see if there are any questions. But you know, I'll, I'll give you three examples of how learning drives this innovation cycle. And so the first characteristic, this, these organizational values that affirm learning's importance. Here's a really good example: um, Airbnb. In at Airbnb, they have a lunch and learn session every week, and so they communicate the value of learning every week because they have everyone getting together. It doesn't matter your job role. You can show up and, uh, and participate in the lunch and learn session. And so in this one, this is just sort of the flyer that goes out, the on online flyer that goes out to everyone's email. Uh, this is the head of Airbnb experience talking with the host, of, um, uh, host education, host experience leader. And they, they spend an hour talking about the market as they understand it. Now, this may not be immediately relevant to people in engineering. It may not be immediately relevant to people in, in the, on the legal team, but it, sh it, 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 makes, it, it makes a statement about the, imp in the importance and value of learning, and it rounds out everyone's context. So people have more context in their day-to-day -day work, no matter where they sit within the company. Uh, 
Secondly, uh, closely aligned business and learning strategies. A really great example is Pixar. Pixar actually spends a lot of time focusing on how to teach creativity. What they learned is they can hire really, really smart people. But if the smart people actually, you know, smart people aren't necessarily always the most creative. And what's actually um, harder is that they don't always manage a, an effective innovation process with other people. And so they have to teach all their employees how to work with one another. And if they, if they, if they can't teach collaboration, they, they, they can't be successful. The second thing is they actually have to teach executives how to deal with high, higher levels of risk than they're used to. And you know, as, as people make it up through the corporate hierarchy, oftentimes their tolerance for risk goes down. And that actually is, makes, makes sense because there's actually, you know, in terms of their own career, there's more room below them than above them. And uh, it's a natural experience for executives to become uh, less risk tolerant. Uh, and as a result, they have to actually spend their time teaching executives to to how to how to measure and accept risk. And I think the the I think the 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 outcomes speak for itself. I mean, if you think about a company that has excelled in this environment, excelled by leveraging creativity, Cars, Wally, Toy Story, in, uh, Incredibles, uh, Finding Nemo, Monsters Inc., uh, Ratatouille, Up. Bugs Life. I mean, you know, the number of incredibly creative and unique stories that they're able to tell over the years. I mean, they have had just blockbuster after blockbuster, but they're blockbusters that aren't based on a formula. They're unique in a lot of ways, and that's because they can teach creativity. So that's a great example of how to closely align your business and learning strategies. Um, the last uh, criteria or characteristic of a learning culture is processes that ingrain learning into the day-to-day -day activities of each employee. I'm going to show you a picture here of Menlo Software. Menlo Software is a small Michigan-based company. It's located in uh, in Ann Arbor. You may be familiar of it, be familiar with it, but this is um, this is a screenshot showing people doing work at the engineering facilities, and you'll notice that you got two people working on one computer. And their whole process is about paired software development. They actually don't, don't expect any of their engineers to do software development alone. They think of it as a paired activity because people learn faster and people can, can gain more expertise by working with another person. Now, um, if you haven't had a chance to read uh, this book, Joy Inc., it's really, really a great book. And it talks about the processes that they've put together to actually drive workplace learning. And it's in, a, in, a, in, in an environment in which it's very difficult to be um, ex ex successful as a small company. Menlo, Menlo um, has, has thrived. And a lot of it is because these processes ingrain learning in the day-to-day -day activities of each employee. So uh, I'm gonna just stop there and see what questions we have. What questions do we have? All right, no questions for now. That is fine. We'll, we'll, have, we'll stop after each one of these, uh, these next tips. I'm gonna go through and I'm going to give you seven tips to building a learning culture. And we can stop stop along the ways and talk about sort of people's experience trying to do some of the things that uh, have been arti are, I'm going to articulate. But the first, when we talk about organizational values that communicate the, um, the value of learning to every single employee, uh, I'm going to talk about AT&T, Discover, uh, GE, Best Buy, and United Healthcare. I'll give you specific examples of things that they're doing. Uh, when it comes to how to build a learning strategy that supports and enables business strategy, I'll give you two examples, Dollar General and Edward Jones, two great examples of, of how to use learning to drive business strategy. Uh, and the third, processes that drive day-to-day -day learning. I'll talk a little bit about Valvoline, Coca-Cola, PwC, a company called JumpRamp, and Google. And that will give you a good idea. It's just, just some examples of, of things that you can do to drive day-to-day -day learning. All right, so here's tip one, and this is under the organizational val values moniker. You know, organizational values that affirm learning's importance. Tip one is promote learning opportunities and benefits. And this is really like, like when you're communicating to your employees, 
you should be looking for ways that you can promote learning as as a value of the company and and as um, an opportunity that all your employees have. So the reason is is that L and D departments that actually do a good job promoting opportunities uh, to their learning programs. They send a really strong message to their employees regarding the value of learning and the importance of learning within the workplace. So it's almost like you could you could communicate to everyone, hey, don't forget to learn, like learning's important. But if you can communicate specific opportunities that, that people have at their disposal, you're actually creating that message and also giving people an avenue through which to fulfill that learning. So the way to th think about this is look for every single opportunity you have uh, to embed learning in HR communications. And so some of the opportunities, when you promote benefits and opportunities to potential employees, uh, when you're marketing learning programs to existing employees, if you have um, a, a weekly newsletter, I discover we had a weekly newsletter that went out telling everyone what the coming classes were and why they were valuable. Uh, celebrating learner outcomes and, and the business benefit of training. This is something that a lot of companies do is when uh, if they have an education assistance and pro, um, um, program, they actually publicize graduations. When people graduate from college through, through a tuition uh, assistance program or educational assistance program, uh, companies communicate that to all their employees to celebrate it. Um, some uh, additional consider considerations, just some things to think about. Consider working with a broader HR team to integrate the value of learning into your employee value proposition. If you don't have an employee value proposition, it may be something that's worth developing with HR more broadly. And think you can think about it is why an employee would want to come work at your company and why they would want to stay at your company once they once they started working there. And that employee value proposition, to the extent that you can embed learning in that and, and promote learning as a key value, as a key benefit that employees get, um, that actually really helps in a, an integrated employee value proposition. Uh, I'll give you, a, I'll show you an example. This is AT&T. This is their, um, when you apply for a job at AT&T, they, they promote their, uh, their perks. And you can see they've got seven perks that they promote, uh, that they basically have competitive compensation. They got healthcare, blah, blah, blah. Two of the seven of their perks that they promote are learning-based. One is their tuition assistance program. And second is their ongoing training and development program. And so right there integrated in with, with their pitch to employees about why people would want to come work at at and learning is front and center, one of the most important things they mention. So I'm going to just stop there and see if there are any questions before we move on. A comment from us at the chamber, the toolkit that we are providing to you will have templates to do this type of outreach to uh, staff meeting scripts, email templates, uh, just tools to help you start to promote opportunities like this to your employees. So stay tuned for that. Great. All right, let's tip two. And this is once again under organizational values that affirm learning's importance. So tip two, involve organizational leaders in your training programs. And so uh, leaders as teachers, there are some companies do, I'll talk a little bit about some companies that do a nice job of this, but companies that engage executives to deliver and lead L&D programs really make a strong statement about the value of learning to the enterprise. If it's important enough for a senior or executive vice president to take time out of his or her busy day to sit down and, and help train employees, that sends a statement to everyone that learning is important at the, at the company. Now, um, the way to, you know, the way that's most effective in going about this is engage, just engage your C-suite executives in a discussion about how they could participate in company training programs. You know, I, I, what I found is that executives often are looking for opportunities to, to contribute to the development of others, and especially um, executives as they get later on in their careers, they're looking for what their legacy is going to be. And oftentimes the a legacy around developing other people is something that you know, people can be most proud of. And so formal leaders teaching leaders programs are really this great way for leaders to expand their impact. Now, here are a couple additional considerations. The more you can make it fun and easy for your leaders, the greater the likelihood of success. So 
it's it's rare that a, an executive vice president is going to say, yeah, I'll develop a class and I'll teach it. We'll meet, you know, uh, once a week for the next eight weeks. But boy, if 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 it's easy for them, it's a lunch and learn session, a panel discussion, a fireside chat. You know, any ways you can keep their investment to a minimum is uh, can be really effective. Uh, one thing that uh, that we did um, when I was at Discover is we engaged executives to actually teach what they're really good at, and so we had the um, uh, our, our CFO who was really good at just taking a PL and just stripping it down and really at under, understanding the financial me uh, mechanism that underpins the company. And he actually talked about just like he went through the PL statement at, uh, at Discover to talk about like, you know, how he understood it and what are the things that he picked up on. And, uh, and that was something that he was passionate about. It was really important for, for people to have that capability if they moved up in the finance organization. Um, we had, the, there's uh, that, the head of the card business actually could talk about how he looked at a portfolio. Like when he looks at a spreadsheet of all of these different, different, um, uh, different packages of loans, how does he assess how much the overall portfolio is worth? That's really critical in the financial services industry when you're, when you're doing M&A deals and you have to actually look at a portfolio and, and, and understand how to value it. Here are two examples that do a really good job, GE. So they have this, this Crottonville Executive Development Program. It's been written about a lot. And executives actually take a six month assignment to, to teach leaders in the GE Executive Development Program. So when you actually are tapped to move into executive management or you look like you're someone who has the potential, you do this program. It's actually taught by full-time residents in the Executive Development Program that have taken a six month leave of absence from their job to actually solely teach. That sends an incredible message about the importance of learning. Here's another one, uh, Best Buy. Best Buy actually has this new leader integration program. And, and really what this is, is about is how do you take a person who's been an individual contributor and make them a leader for the first time? And you can teach them as much as you want, but they keep on encountering new experiences that they've never encountered before. And what they found is they found peer learning and mentorship were really important to the development of new leaders. And so what they did is they got existing leaders to participate in this program where they could provide ongoing assistance to new leaders. And that was uh, an opportunity for uh, for existing leaders to expand their impact. And it was an opportunity for new leaders to gain some practical experience from, from a mentor who was assigned by the company. And both these programs, I mean, GE and, and Best Buy, these are examples. I think GE was ranked um, uh, or Best Buy was ranked in the top, uh, top learning programs in uh, 2020 as a result of this exact program. So I'll stop there and see, see if there are any questions around leaders teaching leaders. All right, hearing no questions, we'll move on. Uh, once again, around values that affirm learning's importance, let's talk about implementing education-friendly HR policies. So education-friendly policies, especially when really clearly articulated and promoted, they, they, they illustrate how the company is, is willing to back up and support learning and development. And so you can spend some time, I mean, the best way to get started is spend some time and talk to employees and find out, you know, what are the barriers to being a, a, a learner to engaging in the learning programs that the company offers? So there are usually a lot of, lot of explicit and implicit barriers that get in the way. And so to the extent that you can target those barriers with specific policies that make it easier for, for, for employees to participate in learner, learning, it actually can have a really impact. It can be a multiplier on your learning programs. So oftentimes you can talk to employees and they'll find high cost of tuition, books, supplies, academic fees. This is a barrier that gets in the way. Inflexible work schedules. That's something, you know, a lot of college programs are designed for people who, are, who can take a class from 11 to 12 every Tuesday and Thursday. Inflexible work schedules get in the way of that. Oftentimes companies that have internal approvals for internal training, oftentimes the, the actual billing, the internal cross billing process for training actually acts as the disincentive to learning. And then finally, uh, participation restrictions based on level, tenure, location, et cetera. These are things that get in the way. 
And so, the, you know, one of the things that I would suggest is research the best practices. Detroit uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce has some great examples in the Detroit, Detroit Drives degree, degree sections, and we'll, we'll show a link to that uh, at the end of the presentation. But you can also look for nonprofits. But I think that uh, because they have some some great ideas as well. But I think one of the things to to focus on is try to have it come from the the voice of your learners. What is getting in the way of them being successful learners? Now I'll give you a few examples here, and one that I'm super proud of. So Discover, we we created this program called the Discover College Commitment, and what we did is we paid a hundred percent of tuition all books and supplies, all fees towards one of seven high, high, qualified, uh, high quality bachelor's degree programs. And so what we did is we looked at the barriers. What we found is we had, oh gosh, um, for, for about 20,000 uh, people at the company, I think we had you know, maybe 150 that were participating in our, our, in our tuition reimbursement program. And so we looked at that, we asked employees why they weren't participating. And we got this big punch list of all the barriers to participation. The biggest one was high cost of tuition, books and supplies. So we just took that off the table. We said, we are gonna pay for that 100%. Um, and so there are a bunch of different things. We solved the inflexible work schedules problems. We solved the, the, the participation restrictions, but that's an example where we looked for um, how, do, how can we implement really education friendly policies. I'll give you another example. United Healthcare, actually, if you look on their website, one of the things that they promote uh, is that they offer flexible schedules for students. So if you work at, at United Healthcare and you work in a division where it's actually, you can, um, where, where it's not schedule driven, you can show up and say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm participating in, in, uh, in my bachelor's degree, you know, would it be okay if I uh, adjusted my schedule in order to make classes? And that's something that United Healthcare promotes. And that's a, that's a great example of, of uh, education friendly HR policies. So let me, let me stop there, see if there are any questions. I have another comment from us. So at the same time, we're working with employers to be more education friendly. We are also working with our higher ed partners to be more adult learner friendly, recognizing that I think both people have a role to play in this. So we're working with higher eds to say, maybe you can offer some classes in the evening or on weekends, or we're working on that side of the house too, to make sure that they're aware of the challenges that employer learners face and they're doing their part to sort of mitigate that as well. So um, I'll keep you all posted on that, but just know that that's in the works too. That is great. Thank you, Christy. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, tip four, and this is around closely aligning your business and learning strategies. And specifically, I mean, when we say closely aligned, we really mean a learning strategy that helps drive business strategy. And so tip floor is uh, implementing these learning programs that actually drive strategic business results. And so, you know, this is probably the one that most L&D pr programs scheduled, or most L&D departments struggle with the most. And so, but the, the benefits are really significant. The more L&D departments can show this clear alignment between the, their they're the business drivers of the company and the learning strategies that the L&D department has rolled out, you know, the, the more relevant the training is going to feel and the more, and more support you're going to get from executives internally. So, I mean, the, the approach that I would use here is take your company's business strategy and try to answer four questions. Number one, how do we ensure that the company has the right talent to successfully undertake the strategy? Oftentimes, and especially in this VUCA world, companies are trying to make big swings and they're trying to really transform themselves in ways that you know they probably don't have the talent to do. So the first question you should ask is like, hey, how do we make sure that the, that the company has the right talent? And then the, the second question is, what's our role in developing that talent? Because oftentimes there's a build by decision that you need to make with regard to talent. Oftentimes it's just easier to go find new employees and find employees to hire and uh, that bring a different skill set. But oftentimes there's an opportunity to, to upskill and reskill your existing employees. Um, then the third question is, what capabilities does the L&D department need, um, uh, need to succeed? 
And then finally, how do you align the success metrics with L&D with business objectives? And the reason why that's important is you're, you know, as a, a, most executives are not used to dealing with L&D departments that have a strategic mindset. And so to the extent that you can continue to communicate how L&D strategies drive business strategies, you, it makes everything much easier. And I think uh, um, a scorecard, a dashboard that shows how L&D metrics are related to business metrics. I think that that is just enormously helpful. Um, the, the, uh, one additional consideration I, I tell you is that it doesn't help just to sort of do this and, and, and not let everyone know about it. You really have to share your plan widely and you have to develop an elevator pitch. You have to explain how L&D is become a strategic driver for the business and it, you know, enable all your L&D employees to to, to, to communicate that message, make sure they're clear on how L&D goals support the strategic business initiatives of the company. And so I'm going to give you two examples of companies that have done, done a really good job on this. And both these companies have, been, have, have won awards for this. So Dollar General, one of their, their whole business strategies is having high levels of customer centricity. They really feel like each store manager needs to understand the, the clientele that comes visit and visits Dollar General. And so the L&D team, what they did is they took all of its training programs and they, they embedded in every single L&D program a piece on customer centricity, how to really understand your customers. Uh, and, and that just became a, 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 a fixed part of every single learning program that they had. And as a result, customer satisfaction actually several years into that initiative, customer satisfaction across the enterprise increased by 790 basis points um, after this alignment. So, you know, that can, um, usually, I mean, if you, if you do any, any, um, uh, sort of customer satisfaction scores as a metric, you'll know that those scores, uh, they, they do not move very often. I mean, it is really difficult to move customer satisfaction. So, you know, almost an 8% increase in, in customer satisfaction is pretty darn significant. And this is, you know, this is touted by the leaders of the company as being a result of, of L&D programs that were aligned to the business strategy. Edward Jones is, a, um, I think you're probably familiar with Edward Jones, their um, sort of retail investment house. Uh, and one of their things they realized is that they actually didn't have a, um, an employee base that represented the diversity of its customers. And they, 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 they realized that the reason for that is they had high attrition, especially among people of color and women. And so what they did is they actually created, um, they, the, the L&D department created business coaches for women and people of color. And that was so significant that after implementing the program, I think it was actually only after one year, they found that attrition of women and people of color dropped by 27%, which is, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant drop for, for attrition. I've been working in attrition for years and years and to see a drop that significant really means something's going on. But once again, you know, this was a business strategy that Edward Jones recognized that their employee base had to re represent the diversity of their customers. And the only way they could do that is through improved, um, improved talent retention. And L&D, they, they designed a learning program that focused on that, they effectively communicated it. And and you know when attrition dropped by twenty percent, seven percent, L and D got the got the credit for it. So I'm going to just stop right there. See if there are any questions on this this tip. Not so much a question, John. This is Libby Honig from Kelly. Just a little bit more of an observation, maybe that I've noticed um, that ties to your tip number two and your tip number four, right? Involving organizational leaders and showing that clear alignment um, between L and D and strategic business results. When you do both of those things together in any degree, they make the other one easier, right? Because you've got that leadership buy-in, you've got that support. They communicate that strategy to you more clearly in a way that then they can see how you're supporting it. So I think that tying those two things together really um, drives the engagement in both of them. Uh, Libby, that's a really great point. I mean, off these, I think, I think these, all of these tips are mutual reinforcing in some regard. And to the extent that you can do any of them well, it makes the others easy to do. So that's a really good point. Thank you. Uh, other comments, questions? Okay. 
Tip five, let's we're, we're talk about processes that ingrain learning in the day-to-day -day, uh, activities of each employee. And one thing I'll tell is, is robust job role training is really helpful in this re regard. And so oftentimes you work at a company where you know, you, you come in and it's like, here's a procedure book, read this, talk to anyone if you have any problems. And, you know, that can really be, you know, that, that undermines people's effectiveness, their engagement. If you can require robust job role training, it helps each employee, uh, you know, become fully productive before they start work. It sends a really clear message to, to everyone about the critical, the critical how, how learning is a critical success factor for every individual in the company. And, you know, one of the things to, to I, I've worked in companies where, you know, L&D is a very small part of the company and most of that sort of functional training happens in different business units. I've worked in companies where it's all, all, all centralized. Uh, where the L&D department does all that training themselves. One thing I can tell you is job role training is super expensive and it's really time consuming to build and develop and maintain. So, you know, one thing to, to think about if you can 80-20 this, think about the, the biggest job roles, the job roles that have the most number of employees and see if you can build formal onboarding programs for only the most common job roles in the company and use sort of a federated model where you provide um, business units the ability to build out their own training, uh, providing, providing them sort of business, the, the tools, templates, processes, you know, and build and disseminate um, uh, um, you know, job job role training for more more niche positions, and leave that up to the business units to do. And so, if you can just, you know, a lot of companies, what they'll have is they'll have one or two onboarding programs that just focus on people that come new to the company, and they can do a lot of uh, a lot of acclimatization to the to the company at the same time they're building out specific skills and competencies for job roles. You know, I'd be very wary about over committing and I'd start uh, by enabling business units to provide their own training programs, but then take over those training programs when there's the demand for it. Um, and oftentimes, uh, if you can help employees start to build out their own training programs, pretty soon they'll, they'll say, wow, this is really, really good, but it's not our core competency. We would really like you to take it over. And then you can have the resource discussion and figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, Valvoline is a company that that really invested heavily in their in their onboarding programs, and they have this uh, oil change super pro certificate. It's a 270 hour program for all newly hired employees, and and how you finish in that program determines job roles, promotions, compensations. But they the thing is is that they they make a very clear statement that training is the important to the success of every new employee. Um, and and people take that that value and they replicate it throughout their careers. They 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 actually think of learning in a very different way because learning was such an influential part of their career when they came to Valvoline. And so, to the extent that you can think about these processes that uh, that actually you know create an incentive to learn on a day-to-day day-to-day basis, you know, new hire training is is one of those things that can do a lot of that. Let me stop and see if there are any questions on this one. Hi, this is Marielle Storms. I do have, I don't know if you can go into details about Valvoline a little bit more, but you mentioned that the certification program does determine job roles. Can you maybe explain that a little bit more? Or I don't know if you know those details. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like if you kind of get so many points in a particular area, then do you become, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, role? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I can't talk specifically about this, but I, I actually ran um, a very, very similar onboarding program at Discover. And essentially we brought people in and the very first week uh, we trained them on sort of, you know, um, financial services fundamentals, talking to customers fundamentals. And then basically we could actually start sorting people into different programs depending on their interest and sort of how they're doing. You know, we recognize that there are some lines of business that are much more complicated than other lines of business. And if people could demonstrate in the first couple of weeks that they were mastering the, um, uh, 
uh, the content and they were having authentic conversations with customers very early on, we would move them into sort of more complex job roles. Um, and, uh, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, people, um, it, it, it didn't mean that you were stuck in a less, less complex job role for the rest of your career. It meant that maybe you just needed more time to, to, to sort of gain a foothold and, and become, uh, you know, become competent in, in a job before you moved into something else. So I think it almost, you know, we challenge people at their, um, at their, w where we can challenge them most and where they can contribute most to the company. And I think Valvoline does something very similar. Does that answer your question there? It did. Thank you for giving me that extra bit of information. I was just curious how that worked. And then um, if it kind of streamlined where people would go or fill gaps in uh, talent, you know, I mean, the talent it, strategy. You know, it's challenging because oftentimes the, the um, really the, the question of where someone goes in their career is more based on the demand of the company for job roles. But there's oftentimes that you need to fill a certain number of job roles, but then you can actually slot this person into job role A or job role B. It, you know, it's, it's up to the employee and it's up to the, the training department. And we found that we had really good luck if we moved people over into, you know, training, training programs that, you know, or job roles that were more closely aligned with their skills and abilities so yeah I also think it's neat because you you also mentioned that um, it, it was the trainees um, kind of like I this is kind of what I like to do and maybe they discovered a, a skill that they didn't think they had or an area of the company they didn't think that they would fit into so that's why I was very curious about the, the this particular program because sometimes people are so fixated on a job title that but they didn't didn't realize that maybe it's not the right fit for them or it's not the right skills for them but they just want the job title where they actually could move further up and use the skills and actually discover like areas where I was like oh I'm actually really good at this yeah, I mean, sometimes employees will come in and they just impress you right away with a set of skills that are really needed in one department. You know, I'll give you an example at at, uh, at Discover. Um, there's a there's a department that was called billing assistance, which is essentially disputes. So when people people are disputing charges on their credit card bill, they call you in this really heightened emotional sense because something shows up on their credit card bill and they're 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 scared that they're going to get stuck with a charge. And you know, oftentimes what you really need is you really need people that are just in, in control of their own emotions and don't don't let that sort of that heightened emotional sense translate into their own emotional uh, state. They actually can 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 maintain calm and be cool and be be uh, uh, you know and and be comforting to employees or to to customers that are calling in a heightened emotional state and that's something you can tell very very quickly and so sometimes you just say hey you know this would be someone who'd be really good at billing assistance so all right so let's let's move on we've got uh, we've got two more to go two more tips to go and this is in once again back in processes that ingrain learning into day to day activities. Uh, Learning and performance management, can you tie the two together? And so, you know, companies, lever companies that leverage sort of existing processes, for example, performance management can drive increased learning and they can actually drive more management participation in the development of their employees. And so, you know, what I would recommend is if you don't, aren't doing this right now, consider creating an ind individual development activity um, as an added learning goal for each employee as in the standard goal setting process and the review process. So this is something I've done at a, at a, at a bunch of different companies where basically every, comp every employee has to have a set of goals and somewhere between sort of you know, four and six goals is usually norm. Uh, if you can say, look, let's have uh, fewer business goals and let's just have one goal around learning. Just learn something new and what is it gonna be? And so the, the, the benefit of this is if you can get people to, to articulate a learning goal, you can actually engage management much more effectively in actually becoming an active participant in developing that, that learning. And so the, um, the, the benefit is, is that having it as a learning goal actually drives greater consumption 
The problem is, is that may not have a huge impact on employee development if you have managers that aren't good coaches. So I would consider implementing sort of a management development program or something to help managers grow into more effective coaches. So actually when an employee comes to them and saying, hey, here's one of my goals for the year is to, to develop proficiency in this particular area, the manager actually knows how to help them. So I'll give you a, a couple examples. Coca-Cola and PwC are two examples of companies that have uh, formalized learning goals as part of their performance management process. And actually, I think there's there's been a lot of talk over the past five years about getting rid of performance management and replacing it with something that looks more like learning goals and more more dedicated coaching from, from managers. Uh, and I think what you're seeing now is you're seeing more companies that are doing sort of hybrids where they, they maybe they have some learning goals, but fewer or some some business goals, but fewer than they had in the past and maybe they have more learning goals because this is the way that they can they can promote day-to-day -day learning for their employees which they know they need if they're going to keep pace in this uh, this VUCA world that we live in all right let's let's go um just to to the last one and this is processes that engage learning and day-to-day -day activity of employees and i think one of the things you can do is hire enthusiastic learners just change your hiring profile to target learners and so companies that actually hire enthusiastic learners are going to need to spend way less effort on creating, disseminating, and management of formal learning programs. And if you can work with your talent acquisition team to update the company-wide job profile requirements, if you can help them include interview questions and candidate selection protocols to, to actually look for learning aptitude, it can make a, a huge difference in the success of your learning programs, but also the success of employees that are now facing this environment where the, the job roles are turning over. I mean, I think the last thing I read said that the half-life of a job-related skill is now something like 18 months, that every 18 months, half of your skills are, are, no, longer, are, are no longer relevant because the, the job has changed so much. So, you know, to the extent that you, you do something like this, communicate these changes really broadly to your entire populations of learners so that is leaders so that they can really understand the reason for these changes. And I'll give you two examples of companies that are that are doing this. You know, a company one company that's been doing this for a long time is Google. So uh, I'll read you a portion from Inc. Magazine. Eric Schmidt from Google says they seek learning animals, people who are naturally driven to learn on their own. Google has figured out faster than the rest that the key to keeping their terms, their teams at peak performance is to choose employees who are predisposed to learn and grow on their own. Uh, here's a, a company called Jump Ramp. They're actually a gaming company. I think they're actually uh, acquired maybe by Blizzard or um, you know, another, another gaming company. But the, the co-founder said, one of the most difficult challenges at a startup is keeping pace with rapidly evolving needs of a growing company. Hiring for intellectual curiosity means candidates are not only qualified and thoughtful, they're capable of thinking beyond the role they're interviewing for. Now, these are things that actually help all, um, I think we were talking earlier, Libby actually meant this, that uh, some, of these, some of these tips are actually mutually re reinforcing. This is a great one that is mutually reinforcing with everything else. To the, extent, to the extent that you're hiring people who have a natural learning bent, everything actually works much easier. So, uh, so any questions on this before we, we start to wrap up? Hi, this is Marielle Storms again. Um, hi, Marielle. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I I was trying to think. So, um, one of the issues um, that I've run into where people, you know, they come into a company, they're curious, they want to learn, um, but then they run into the problem of if I make a mistake, will I lose my job? And so then there's that fear of taking risk or trying something new. And honestly, like actually when I was recruiting or in a recruiter role, one of my favorite questions to ask candidates is tell me about a time you made a mistake and what did you learn about it? And that was to test their learning agility and it depended on their response, you know, how complex that learning was, right? Um, sometimes companies if you make a mistake it's like if you make it again you're going to get fired and so people are more you know you know risk adverse they don't want to like do anything new when they could have actually learned like 
like a scientist would, right? They make mistakes and they go, oh, that doesn't work. I've learned something new as opposed to this kind of failure feeling that some companies will push forward. So how do you prevent that failure feeling and allow people to learn from mistakes? That's a, Muriel, that's a great question. And, you know, what I'll, I'll tell you is, is that I've had a lot of luck in management training programs where you talk specifically about how, um, you know, how to weigh risk and return for managers. And to the extent that you're actually trying to get your managers to be better coaches, uh, one of the things you can do is help them understand how to think about their work in terms of the things that absolutely they have to get right and they have a very low tolerance for error and everything else that actually doesn't have to be 100% right. And we used to t t tell people um, at, at, in one of the management development programs that, uh, that we ran, we used to ask them, how many of you guys are part of the, uh, are part of the brain surgery department at Discover? It's like, Okay, no one's part of the brain surgery department. So really most of the decisions you make are probably not life or death decisions, right? Given that, let's think about all the different decisions you make and which are the ones that can be a little ragged around the edges. The truth is that very few decisions are either 100% right or 100% wrong. Most decisions can uh, are sort of somewhere in between that, you know, an 80% right is probably good enough. And I always used to tell my managers uh, that when they were trying to engage their employees, that a decision that is, you know, 95% right implemented with like a 15% enthusiasm factor from employees is probably not going to be that successful. It's better to actually engage people in decision making, let them make real decisions for themselves, have decisions that maybe are mostly right, 80% right, but are implemented with 100% enthusiasm and that there's there's an understanding that when things are wrong, you actually have to have to go back and and revisit them and rapidly adjust. So I think a lot of this is around how managers operate in this environment. So let's quickly summarize. So, you know, once again, a learning culture is defined by these three things, organizational values that affirm learning's importance, closely aligned business and learning strategy, and then processes that ingrain learning in the day-to-day -day activities of each employee. Uh, a learning culture is really critical to keeping up with businesses disruptions in this VUCA world. And the, the seven strategies that we can recommend Number one, promote learning opportunities and benefits, involve leaders in training programs, implement education-friendly HR policies, implement learning programs that actually drive strategic result, business results, require robust job role training, tie learning performance, tie learning to performance management, and finally adjusting your hiring profile to target really enthusiastic learners. So, uh, so I think we've only got a few minutes left, but I'm willing to take any questions that uh, have not yet been answered. What other questions do we have? This might be a bit in the weeds, but I'm going to ask it if no one else has a question. Um, so we are very interested in sort of transferable credentials that folks get. We have an education attainment goal. Um, have you seen examples of employers partnering with higher ed institutions to actually have credit awarded for some of the employer-led training opportunities that you discussed, like the, the rigorous onboarding programs. Have you seen that um, come, come to fruition anywhere that has been successful? Yeah, we, we've, um, we've actually done, I actually did that at Discover where we got, uh, I think we got nine credits for people's uh, onboarding programs, depending on the onboarding programs. I think some of them, we only got six credits and some we mm -hmm. got 10 or 11 credits. But yeah, I mean, you, you, take, you take your onboarding program and uh, you take all the, all the printed material and you give it to the university, you get uh, bios, you get resumes from all your instructors. And, um, and oftentimes, you know, universities that recognize that the way they're gonna stay alive in this environment is they're gonna target uh, businesses 
and businesses with adult workers mm -hmm. recognize that that one of the things they're going to have to do is make it easier for people to get through their programs and to give to do a prior learning assessment or give credit for prior learning is really going to be a critical strategy and there are a few universities that do a really good job at this they're mostly big online competency-based universities like Western Governors, uh, like uh, uh, Southern New Hampshire. Uh, Brandman does a pretty good job of that. Bellevue does a pretty good uh, job of it. I mean, th these are the kind of universities that, that have invested in big online programs that scale really well, and they've, they've worked with creating partnerships with, uh, with corporations. Thank you. That's great. If anyone wants to think about implementing something like that um, with local higher eds, talk to us at the chamber. This is something that we really care about. So thank you for that. I'm glad it worked at Discover. Yeah, one of the things I would say is that it's it's oftentimes it's really difficult to work directly with universities and having an intermediary like and if the, if the Discover the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce can do this, it can be really helpful. Cool. Thank you. Any last questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Um, so you, uh, you all have my contact information. Um, you have our website with follow-up information. If questions come up, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We are happy to continue these conversations and support you as you implement some of these things. So just please stay in touch. Um, we will have a toolkit ready to share very soon. So stay on the lookout for that and we will make sure we get that to you as soon as it's available. And I will be following up very soon here with the recording and the slides. So um, if there are no final questions, thank you again to John for leading us through this. And thank you to all of you for your time this morning. Hey, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. This was excellent. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Everyone thank have you. a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.